Hi everyone and welcome to today's session. This is Nihal Munir. I'll be your moderator for the day. So as always, please keep your questions that are related to the content of the lecture in the Q&A part. Throughout the lecture, Susan will be asking you a few questions. Please leave the answers to these questions in the chat box so I can collect this for her. Again, questions in the Q&A part. If she asks you a question, leave it in the chat part. So uh, the topic for today is a great one. It's very interesting. It's something new in the oil and gas industry. It's basically 3D printing for cores and all sorts of stuff. So <clears throat> for you who you guys who were asking about the new technologies which focus on and stuff like that, this is the lecture for you. So without any further ado, let me introduce our speaker for the day. Our speaker is Dr. Susan Nash. Susan Nash is Director of Innovation, Emerging Sciences and Technology for AAPG. Dr. Nash promotes new science and technology development, adoption and commercialization and has launched an administrative uh, an innovation and an innovative uh, accelerator program, U Pitch, Science and Technology Showcase. She has designed and administrated online and hybrid education and training programs for more than 20 years. In addition, she has experience in operations for both petroleum, mining, and chemical manufacturing. She earned her Bachelor's of Science in Geology, Master's of Art, and PhD at University of Oklahoma. Susan, over to you. Uh, thank you. Well, I'd like to tell everyone that it's really a pleasure to be here and express my thanks to, um, to our, um, our organizers. And it's just really an honor to be invited and just want to um, say I really admire what you're doing. And anyway, I want to say good afternoon for those who speak English and who are in the um, Western Hemisphere. And buenas tardes for, for those who speak Spanish. And I'll just stop with those languages. <laughs> but I will try to speak um, slowly and clearly because I know that this, um, this, this type of, of um, uh, communication is sometimes a little bit challenging. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about 3D printing in drilling, exploration, and production. But I want to really go, what I really want to do is ask you to think about how you might fit into this new world and think about the abilities that you have now and how you could, can basically train yourself to play a, a part, even if it's just a part as a, a team member. I really think that in the future, this kind of agility and technology that has the ability to to be manufactured in response to a need or to avoid problems in the future is really, really critical. So first of all, here we have our trusty drill bit. <laughs> and the question might be, wow, can we, we uh, 3D print a drill bit? And the answer is absolutely yes. Now the, the question is, will it, what, how will it perform? And that's why, where we get into the major issues <clears throat> of 3D printing. It's not that we can't we do something, we can't make it look attractive, but what we have are materials issues. Do, what, are, what is the material science? How, in other words, how strong is the metal and how well are those bonds going to come together? And, and we'll wonder, okay, will it work now and how will it work in the future? And these are some of the, the major issues that we have to, to ask ourselves. I know that probably many of you have, have seen videos of say new buildings or bridges that like absolutely crumble after just a few years. And you think, well, okay, what happened to that? Was it just extreme weathering or corrosion? Many times it's not that it's in the manufacturing process of the material that you're, that you're using. And because the equipment or the part or the, even the, the entire say module of something has, has been um, 
printed, basically assembled, manufactured on demand, and it looks good, the assumption is that it will ha have predictable um, properties, not just now, but in the future. And what we're seeing is we're in a, a kind of unknown territory, and we're, we're asking people to use 3D printing for things that are high stakes. If they break, that's going to be terrible. But then if we wait for the regular process, that we have a lot of downtime. So we're in a, a world that, that requires um, a deeper look at everything right now. So like, can we 3D print drill bits? The answer is yes, we can make teaching models, we can make attractive souvenirs, but how will, how will this hold up in, in high stress, high pressure, high temperature environments? Um, that we need to, to understand exactly what the materials are, how the machine was working when it was printing it and manufacturing it. And we, we also, above all, need to, to do a risk assessment. And I'm not going to get into how exactly to, to, to de develop um, a risk assessment until later, but it's, that's a key part of any type of 3D enterprise. So here's the dream versus reality. So let's take a look at where we are with um, 3D printing. And if, in case you're wondering what 3D printing is, if, is it just sort of like magic? The answer is kind of. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit magical, but we'll get into what exactly 3D printing is. But let's just say for now, what 3D printing is, is it's a way to fabricate different parts quickly and sometimes uh, inexpensively, um, sometimes not so inexpensively, but you have to look at how much downtime you're saving. And then we also have um, to look at, at the pros and cons. So let's look at the value brought into via 3D printing. And let's look at the suitability for, for being printed. Because if you are asked to be in a team to evaluate, say for example, in your gas processing plant or gas gathering plant or pipeline or um, drilling operations, they say, oh, we're having all these problems with this part breaking or it, we have supply chain issues and we can't get certain parts. I don't know how many of you have been affected by COVID-19. <laughs> I would imagine that, that if they, we have 100 people in a room, 90, well, they won't be in a room because we're under lockdown, but it, out of 100 people that we might ask, um, 99 have been dramatically affected by um, COVID-19. Now, we as human beings are affected, but imagine how our processes and even like our equipment, our parts, et cetera, thinking of, of of you know, other things in, in our ecosystem, our business ecosystem, processes have been dramatically affected. And so, for example, um, parts in supply chains, for there we, we became aware as a world how much we depended on uh, manufacturing in China when those um, factories shut down. Then we became aware of how much we were affected by other issues in the supply chain, like container um, ship containers shortage. So shipping container shortages. I'm going to close the door. There's a never fails. I start getting on a Zoom meeting and they start mowing the lawn outside. It's too loud. I think a Zoom meeting is, is a lawnmower magnet. Anyway, <laughs> that's my opinion. <laughs> so anyway, um, so just to get back to, to the issues, one of the reasons why 3D printing is more important now than ever is because of the disruptions in supply chains. So supply chain, just to jog your memory, is the entire pathway that goes from the purchase order 
for a part all the way to where it's being used. So, so let's say that, and, and that includes the warehouse, that includes the transportation, that includes being in the port, the shipping, it includes the, the trucks, it includes the um, shipping containers, and it include, includes um, the work done. So, um, so basically, what we've had in 2020 is disruption of every part of that supply chain. And that means that we have extremely uh, dramatic challenges in getting things like, and let's look at some of the things in this, this chart. We have challenges, for example, in pipeline pigs. Pipeline pigs and also coupons are using corrosion control in, in, in um, cross-country pipelines, and they need to be replaced. If you can't get the, um, if you can't get the, the part, that means that your production and your entire operations are shut down. Oh, not again. Sorry, French door blew open. <laughs> Anyway, um, so for example, nozzles in a downhill cleanout tool, sand co control clean, um, pipeline pigs, gas turbine nozzles, if anything, any of those are broken, then what that means is that the operations are shut down. If you can't get the part for a week, a month, um, a, a year, then you'll find yourself using substitutes and those substitutes may not be very good or the consequences of say not having pipeline pigs will start showing up as your pipeline um, degrades. So, so uh, some technologies are better suited to near-term 3D printing capabilities than others. So the drill bits, we talked about that. Right now drill bits are high potential but they are not exactly um, likely because, and they're not a proven use case, primarily because of the way that um, additive manufacturing occurs and the fact that, that the integrity of the metal cannot be ensured in all conditions. And then the other issue, like, but we have some cases of subsea chemical injection, um, gas turbine nozzles, nozzles for downhole cleanouts. As we'll see in the future in, in, for, in this, nozzles have been a very, very good uh, piece of equipment to manufacturing and 3D, 3D printing. So anyway, other things like sealing accessories, O-rings, joints. Um, those don't bring, those are not too interesting because the value is low. There's the, the best um, decision making um, criterion for determining what's um, useful for 3D printing is how much value you get into it. Okay, so here, um, let's go to our next. So let's basically back up a step and let's say, what is 3D printing? Now, 3D printing in using polymers is essentially, uh, it's basically uh, extrusion. And, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with, with low density polyethylene or some of the different polymers and the different processes, say blow molding or extrusion. In, in 3D printing for polymers, it's essentially extrusion. So what you'll get in terms of your raw material are what look like wires or filaments. And they'll be fil filaments of things like ABS, or they may be filaments of, of uh, green polymers that are based on, created from corn, corn-based. But um, they, they will, are made to see the things that you may be able to try out in the near future, basically look like things that you've made with Minecraft. And those are what most a lot of people think about when they think about 3D printing. 
And if you've seen a 3D printer, basically what it, it looks like if it's a plastic one or use it using polymers, um, you'll see a lot of nozzles going around and then they'll just, they're just following a plan. It's usually CAD or, or something else, um, but it's a, it's a plan or, um, and it's a program, an L, it, a program that is a design program, it's digital, and you can send it to, once you design it, you can send it to the local, local 3D printer uh, or not so local, <laughs> wherever it might be. And you can have your, um, your product made. And using it with um, polymers is kind of a low, um, low risk area to get started. And a lot of people sort of cut their um, teeth doing that because they could do things like uh, d design different types of, 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 of basically anything, but uh, you could do toys, shoes, products, plates, cups, um, gardening materials, just anything that you, you might have. So that's a very different kind of endeavor than 3D printing with metal. And I'm focusing primarily on metal, although there, are ceram there is also ceramics um, 3D printing. And so in, in the case of, of um, 3D printing for metal, what your raw materials are, are basically a powder of metal, a powdered metal, and it's usually an alloy. And you'll also have equipment, and the equipment includes a laser. What is a laser used for? It's used to melt that um, powder, powdered metal. And then you'll also have the, the, um, ma uh, the machine that has a vacuum and you have um, certain cooling and temperature controls and also um, different controls on, on the, the process and sequence of putting this layer upon layer upon layer of, of metal dust, basically metal, um, metal powder that you're melting. So once you understand that, that you see a, a drill bit, it's just really basically uh, uh, was powder. It's a very different situation. Now, how is that different than regular manufacturing? Manufacturing for metal pieces is usually done through casting. And so casting means that you have the, the, the metal that was probably uh, micronized and, and, and pulverized. So it was powder too, but it was melted. So you have it in this melted um, receptacle. The receptacle pours into the cast and the cast cools. So your challenges with, with um, manufacturing and casting with equipment really has to do with, with the bonds that are formed under pressure changes, remember thermodynamics, <laughs> under pressure and temperature and, and also um, chemical regimes. So that's a very different situation than if you are putting layer upon layer upon layer and accreting, making it just basically an accretionary process with your um, 3D, with, your, with the um, powder that you're melting with the laser. So we call it additive manufacturing. So 3D printing, metal 3D printing is synonymous with additive manufacturing. And it's the, in just basically, it's the process of making three dimensional solid objects from a digital file. A digital file can look like a CAD file. And the processes are additive processes um, additive, I think, is not a very precise term. I would say accretionary is, is actually a better way to look at it. So the additive processes, you lay down successive layers of material until the object is created. So um, it just builds up and builds up. Each layer is a thinly sliced horizontal cross-section of the object being constructed. So. If you want to get into 3D printing, start thinking in, in 3D immediately. <laughs> start doing sketches, thinking, get out your Minecraft. <laughs> start playing games, building things, building things up. And think about th looking at things horizontally, vertically, plane view, plan view, et cetera. 
So 3D uh, printing is much more flexible than regular manufacturing. And why is that? Because it sounds like, wow, it's kind of complicated. You have all this, this equipment, and you have to have the powder and the temperature and the file. But imagine what's involved in casting. In casting manufacturing, you have to create a cast. And the cast is um, expensive and slow. And, it's, and if you need to change it, it's an expensive pro process. And also one of the things about 3D printing that is simultaneously wonderful and alarming <laughs> is that many experiments are being done now to see just how much um, material you can take away from the piece without losing any kind of, of strength. And so a lot of analyses have been done on strength of materials and also rigid body mechanics and, and statics to see exactly where the, where the, um, the um, weight bearing or the load is, and then what's, what's really actually um, working in the, in, the, in the application and what's not and, and actually just taking out the material that's not being used to bear the load. And I, I, I say it's alarming because if you increase this, the surface space, you actually increase the sort spaces or surfaces upon which you can have oxidation. So, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of work needs to be done on the, the way that, that corrosion occurs in 3D printed materials versus others. And you can see the um, because it's a powder, if you're not careful, you're going to have a surface that's irregular and it will have many places for, for oxidation to start taking hold. Okay, so let's just take a look at different kinds of, of um, 3D printing and I've included polymers as well, just so that we can um, compare. Now, the material extrusion is um, probably the most um, popular at this point, but it's uh, the material is selectively dispensed through nozzle or orifice in layers, the so plastic, nylon, sand, sort of ceramics. Um, and then yeah, and it'll just so I'm kind of looking at this is the most most commonly used um, 3D printing for polymers, and then the other um, most po popular would be powder bed fusion, and so in this case we have laser, and we have different kinds of polymers and fibers that can be used in conjunction but basically use thermal energy, this tiny, teeny tiny diagram, oops, sorry about that, um, to go into uh, the different parts. Then you have, and that's where you have the, the powder. And then the sheet lamination, um, sheets of material are bonded to, to form an object. And that's a, not a kind of typical 3D printing that you would see for some of these complex parts, especially the ones like nozzles where it used to be 20, 30 individual pieces welded together. And now instead of that, it's just a single part. So I just wanted to point that out as a major, major advantage of 3D printing is that you can get a way, you can get out of the welds. And as you, you know, weakness, the most um, um, equipment fails fails either around the weld or in the weld. The weld sometimes is stronger than the material itself and then that causes differential stress and strain and it causes um, equipment failure, material failure, whereas sometimes the weld itself disintegrates. So welds are a problem. <laughs> Wherever you can avoid a weld, it's, it's better. And then also welds often have um, different micro fissures 
and that allows uh, oxidation to take place again, and that's also corrosion. And then we also have direct energy deposition, and this is um, a focused thermal energy that fuses materials as deposited. That is, um, and this is the one that is used for most, most complex uh, 3D printing in, in metal. So we have wire and powder, laser, et cetera. So I'd say powder bed is, is, is very important in direct, directed energy deposition, DED, is, is um, important. So how do, you, how do you start? What do you, what do you have? You have your powder, you have your materials, you have your laser, you have your equipment. Now what do you need? You need your 3D model. So you can create your own model, um, probably not very advisable unless it's a toy, <laughs> but, or, or a piece of art. I would highly recommend experimenting with art, it is an art form to get started. But you can create your own or download from a repository. And there are a number of repositories of 3D printing, not just metal printing, but also um, polymers. And you also need some 3D modeling software. A lot of that's free. I'm going to let you know where you can find it. And you need potentially a haptic device or code. That's not necessarily, necessarily. that's just to, to unlock your, your, um, your, your, your um, file. So here's an example of a simple 3D file. Now, do you want to get started and, and, and just play around with this? And um, you may want to license 3D modeling software, but you may not. You may want to just try something open source. So highly recommend going to Tinkercad. Tinkercad is free, you can download it. Free lessons, you can build your own model. It's browser-based, so you probably need a pretty good connection while you're um, working with Tinkercad. But um, it's just great, and you can you can actually build your own little projects, and and I, I see it as a big resume builder because you can build them, play around with them, showcase them on your on on um, you know wherever you, Instagram <laughs> have your showcase of, of what you've done, and and then it, you can make that as part of your um, re repertoire, um, part of a portfolio. Now, I don't know how many of you play Minecraft. If you don't, that's fine. If you do, that's great. And here's an example of how the, 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 the path from Minecraft to Tinkercad to a 3D model is, is a very short path. And here's, here's an example of something that was 3D printed, but it was based on a Minecraft model. So, so if your parents say, why are you still playing Minecraft? Get, get away from your phone. <laughs> Tell them, I'm building my future. <laughs> so anyway. Now, here are a, a few places where you can go to, oops, sorry about that. I'm trying to move around my um, little, okay. So here's the preparation of the 3D model slicing. So the 3D slicing, slicing software, that's essentially what's used to command or teach or tell the, 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 um, your machine, the 3D printing machine, what to do. And it's in, and the 3D um, process and the printing process is in um, slices. And it's and it and each slice corresponds to, uh, to to a grid. So slicing divides a 3D model into hundreds or thousands of horizontal layers, and each one of those has has a very specific um, composition, and it also has a very specific location. And so that's basically how you start, your, the equipment starts to, to assemble it and create the um, accretionary process, start the accretionary process of building 
your object. So um, I highly recommend going to Kira or Simplify 3D or Matter Control. And as you go to them, and it actually Paint 3D. I, I mean, I've never used Paint 3D in, in, for this purpose, but supposedly you can use Paint 3D and that comes free on your, uh, on your windows. <laughs> but um, again, I wouldn't use it for high stakes anything, <laughs> but for trying out, why not? And so basically you, the program breaks the 3D model into instructions for laying down the layers. So what does it look like if you are in a factory that does a lot of 3D printing? And what on earth goes on in these massive factories? So you see the people walking around in lab coats and they have booties on um, and they, um, they don't have masks, so it was clearly pre-COVID. But anyway, um, they actually they probably should be wearing masks just for um, particulate control. But at any rate, what um, so essentially each one of these pieces of equipment is a 3D printer, and each one has uh, specific instructions. And as you can see, they um, the 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 feedstock. It's not like regular manufacturing with casting where you have like massive molten, um, or, or maybe not so, so massive, but you, you'd have your feedstock would be equal the size of the, the equipment or, or more, especially in casting. In this case, you have um, just a, a self-contained, what looks like a printer. And so, I, I mean, I think, again, I think that the, the, the name 3D printing is, is confusing because it's, it's not printing, it's laying down it, or extruding. And the idea of additives manufacturing is mis misleading too. Um, you are manufacturing the additives, but really basically what you're doing is, is manufacturing the process in which the additives interact with each other to create bonds. So I don't know how many of you have taken um, uh, optical mineralogy or strength of materials yet or, or organic chemistry or, or basically any chemistry advanced physical chemistry by the if you think about the bonds that's what is the the make or break element of 3d printing is you're wanting to create bonds between um, each of the layers so uh, the additives in um, their adding together, that um, additive process is um, optimized to create the best possible bonds. So what is the guy in lab coat looking at? What kind of, um, what kind of controls does he care about with this, with this um, piece of equipment? He's making sure that it's going at the right rate of deposition, and why would that be? It's because you want to have the optimal amount of time for those bonds to, to um, create, form. Basically a lattice, if you remember uh, a, a lattice. So um, he's also looking at, and she's getting ready to, <laughs> looking at the temperature, the pressure, making sure that it's a vacuum, that you don't have any impurities, and, and, and again, what they're really basically doing is they're putting layer upon layer, but they're, they're growing crystal, they're growing lattices. And they're growing lattices in, to create um, this bonds that, that give strength of material. So there's a lot that can go wrong with that, as you, as you can imagine. And because there are so many things that can go wrong, um, Stratasys, which is probably the, the leading um, 3D manufacturing, um, metal 3D manufacturing um, equipment manufacturer in the world, they took the lead in order to try to establish standardization. Because any kind of high profile failure of parts, especially since a lot of it's being used in aircraft, is going to, to um, 
um, basically ruin the market forever because it, there will be no trust. So it's important to keep make sure there's standardization, not just in standardization in the testing and quality control or QA process, but also in the, the way that things are manufactured. So standardization in, say, the particle size, the grain size of the, of the feedstock, of the um, um, titanium powder or the different materials. Um, also, the, the um, process in terms of the sequences of temperature and how, what type of laser, how large the laser is, how long, what's the pulse rate, et cetera. And then standardize the equipment and standardize the materials in the manufacturing process. Because if not, there's no way at all to assure the, the performance of that part. And it's extremely challenging because um, there's variability of materials and machines. And, and because of that, I, I suspect that, that there are going to be a few um, printer company providers that, that dominate, especially for fitness for purpose, um, depending on what the specific use is. Um, I know the general manager of, of Xerox, the 3D printing, and she's in New York City, and they've been having, um, they have some really, really wonderful dreams and, and, and goals. Right now, they, they do um, sort of white label 3D printers, so they, they produce the 3D printers, but they are um, usually sold under a different brand. They want to get into it with their Xerox name and have the Xerox is like the standard for 3D printing. And this is um, going to be challenging. They have to, to basically focus on a few niches first. There's a company in San Francisco, Evaldi. They focus on maritime and also oil and gas equipment and why they, and they're not in, 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 um, in aerospace at all. Now GE is, is very much in, in aerospace and we'll get into some of those examples. So additive uh, man, manufacturing quality assurance through qualification. So essentially what the standards are, they're going to focus on specific machines and settings, um, machine calibration, machine operation, material selection, addressing the challenges of consistency and reliability. Now, what's the problem with any of this? I say that there's a big problem that once you start saying machine calibration and operation, and you, and you go through this long bureaucratic process of standardizing, the big problem is that um, you can't modify your equipment. So anyway, let's see how um, 3D printers are used in drilling, exploration, production. Right now, we, they're used for rapid prototyping. So let's say that, that you don't really feel that your, your 3D printed drilling bit is going to, to do anything but shatter down hole and, and, have some, and force you to have a lot of expensive uh, fishing trips <laughs> or potentially make you lose the hole. Let's say that, that you don't want to have that but you do need to have some prototypes that for more traditional, um, more traditional manufacturing, casting, et cetera. Well, you can use 3D printers to create prototypes. And that way you can make a prototype, look at it, say, oh, okay, we can do some preliminary testing. Doesn't really work. Does it fit with this, this uh, piece of equipment? We can make a change. And it's very easy to do that in initial design stages and you save months and months and months in getting to, um, the, to, to manufacturing itself. And then it's relatively inexpensive to build many working models instead of just one or two. And then the next stage we get, can get into rapid manufacturing. So you can use 3D printers for short run, small batch, custom manufacturing. And one of the areas where, where there's a lot of acceptance and not too much worry about um, how, how these pieces of equipment will perform in, uh, in difficult situations is in the area of discontinued car parts or classic and vintage cars. 
So for example, let's say that um, somebody had, um, they found a, 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 in somebody's like old garage somewhere, a, 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 a huge like car from, from the 1930s, maybe a, I don't know, Rolls Royce. So let's say Rolls Royce from the 1930s. It's really elaborate and it's amazing. But where on earth are you going to get the spare parts? You'll never make it work. Well, you can make spare parts by 3D printing them and so actually be able to revitalize an entire type of, of, of um, business. So if you like to, to rebuild cars and parts, wow. You know, if you, if you can work with some people who have 3D printing, you can make a lot of different um, beautiful cars. Aviation, you can print a single part, eliminate having to weld pieces together. Fuel nozzles is an example. So here's an um, example. So let's just take a look at, at GE Aviation. Their Auburn, Alabama plant, they 3D printed a fuel nozzle that streamlined manufacturing. And instead of having 20 welded together parts, there's one single part, and the weight was cut by 25%, process used titanium powder, which sounds really good, and it even gets better, because in 2019, they printed 30,000, they manufactured 30,000 fuel nozzles for the GE LEAP engine, or their LEAP engine. And the LEAP engine is GE's high efficiency reduced emissions jet engine. And so why is a nozzle so challenging? And why is it so desirable to put and print it in 3D. Well, first of all, you want it to be, um, you want to make a lot of them because they have to be replaced pretty quickly. Why? Because they mix the jet fuel with air and they have, um, they are, they're incredibly important in the performance of, of the engine. I mean, you have to have the right mix of air and fuel. And they also, um, there are a lot of them. So it's a, an ideal thing. And then with that, and you get to eliminate, again, the issue of the welds. If you have 20 different parts coming together to create one fuel nozzle, then if you can create it just one single surface, well, not surface, one single part, a seamless surface, you have a lot of advantages. So just to give you an idea of the, the environment, though, that this is, is working in, this is just inside the LEAP engine. And so we have um, this, this amazingly, amazingly complex system that, that all depends on the right mix of fuel and water. If it doesn't have that, none of these parts work correctly. And so, um, so understanding that is, is incredibly important. Now, here you see, look inside the, the engine itself, you can see certain opportunities for 3D printing. And some of the, the more um, intriguing and more attractive areas are in the places where you have um, a lot of different, different surfaces that need to be very precisely uh, manufactured with the, the right kind of angles for, for the group and the right kinds of grooves. And they need to fit together really well so that they move, move um, smoothly. And so you want e extreme uniformity here. So anyway, I um, already said this, but it, we'll just point out it's five times more durable and 30% more cost efficient. So it's a big win. Now, here we have uh, another example of 3D printing. And this is um, fusing layer upon layer. Now, this is a titanium um, additives manufacturing in Plattsburgh, New York. It's brand new. And the company is Norsk Titanium. Now, honestly, I don't think that they're <laughs> producing. <laughs> this is not GE. In, in Alabama, so sorry about that, but I just wanted to, to mention the fuel nozzle again. How many layers are in, in that? It's 3,000 layers 
And, and so that's you know, 3,000 opportunities to create lattices that connect those um, um, metal um, atoms together. They're sprayed like a, a laser pen and uh, on molecules. And then the waste cut is uh, dramatically. And then you're fusing the layer upon layer. And then we're using it for a fleet of passenger airline, airplanes so that it, it has potential for um, large scale success and large scale disaster. And we, we kind of see an example of that in, in um, what Boeing went through in 2018 and 2019. So <clears throat> some of these it's also, okay, the fuel nozzles are used, the Airbus A320, the Boeing 737 MAX, why I mentioned Boeing's challenge, <laughs> the 737. And they're also used for sensors, blades, heat exchanger, engine parts. So uh, 3D printing is especially effective if you need to have a lot manufactured and the, either a lot or very few and they require a lot of precision. So in the case of GE, they were able to um, get orders for the fuel nozzle for their, their engine, and they sold 16,000, which meant um, gross revenues of 236 billion just for that. Okay, so um, how does it work? The 3D printer utilizes a, a laser beam, as we mentioned, it men melts 20 to 60 micron layers of metal powder. Then the metal power la powder layers are fused with each other. And this, that's done in two different ways. Either you would spread the metal um, powder over the entire build platform, or you can use it to fuse older layers. So you can use it for repair. So the dangers of 3D printing, as we mentioned earlier, quality assurance can be challenging. The metallurgical properties are vital. And so that, that can be just assumed that, oh, we have it going. Let's just, and so all the equipment's working. Let's just never, never check the equipment. <laughs> you have to be vigilant and have a number of sensors to make sure that the, um, the, the conditions of the printer stay, um, stay within um, the guidelines. And how, what is the long-term performance under stress? It's not always assured. And so if you, any of you are really interested in, in AI and ma machine learning, it's a really good opportunity to use deep learning to create simulations and models to predict what the behavior will be under different circumstances. So again, let's just uh, go through a different overview of types of 3D printing. We have um, ultrasonic additive manufacturing. So you have a thin metal foil, dissimilar metals and matrix. Um, that's not done too often. That it's not as, um, it's been around for a long time, but it has limited application. Powdered bed fusion, powdered metals are consolidated by melting using a laser or electron beam into the final shape desired. So basically weldable alloys are the ideal, um, ideal uh, feedstock and use laser or EB um, electron beam. And then the, the most interesting and what most precise is the directed energy deposition, which we've been talking about. And so you have the powder or wire metal, it's dispersed into a metal pool, adheres to previous layers. And it has, um, um, well, we mentioned just, um, just a key is you can use it for larger components and you can also do spot repairs. So this is the ultrasound. I just wanted to give you a little overview. It's been done since the 1950s, uses foil, and it's basically ultrasonic motion causes oxides to break up. And then as they um, yield and collapse, the asperities yield and collapse. Then there's a, a, a high pressure heat, high strength solid state bonding. So this is why it's really called welding. 
I mean, it's, it's a kind of manufacturing. And then we have the direct metal um, laser melting. And just basically, um, let's see if we have a picture of it. Okay, so here's a, a, a piece of equipment. And essentially you've got la lasers, not just one laser, but many lasers that are melting um, fine metal powder. And they're, they're creating the geometries and they're from the CAD file. So they're just layering them, layering them. And why do we care about the horizontal, um, uh, horizontal slices? It's because that tells you where to keep the empty sp spaces. So the horizontal slice, it, it basically, it, it, it builds it up from bottom up. It just goes up, 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 up. And you care about the absence of, of material as well as the material itself. So I um, just thought this would be fun. I, I'll, sit, I'll share this PDF with you. But you might want to say, take a look at some of the machines and their specs. <laughs> so I need to put some links in here. OK, directed energy deposition, um, laser engineered shaping, net shaping lens, direct metal de deposition, EB, AM, um, electron beam additive manufacturing. But here's, here's the heat source, and it's melting. OK. So here we have the, uh, a, a kind of cartoon look. But if you have directed energy deposition, um, it's the equipment goes into the box and it can either be st static, but the beam is what moves. And then you have a source of the feedstock and the, the conditions occur within the box itself. So the, the wire or the powder nozzle powder goes through the nozzle, is depositing on a surface, and then the equipment selectively, the, the, um, the laser selectively melts, and so the, the stuff that's not subjected to heat falls away. And then if you, if you notice on, if you look for jobs in 3D printing, you'll say, Gee, what, there, there are all these uh, people that need, that at the end of this, you have to be able to um, do the cleanup of this of thing. So you have to have expert people who are able to, to um, um, clean the surfaces and make them oops, work well. Okay, so just a closer, different look. So you have the powder stream the powder feed nozzles, then you have the heat source, and then the layer thickness, and then there's, and then this, um, uh, the block that goes back and forth, depending on the size and the design of your, of your product. And you may be wondering what kind of alloys, so you have titanium, Inconel, tantalum, tungsten, niobium, stainless steel, steel, aluminum, more. So why do you have some of those weird ones? <laughs> they give the metal alloys its special their special properties. So as we kind of wrap up here, getting close to wrapping up, um, 3D printing in the petroleum industry. So here's a nozzle for um, for a fuel, a fuel nozzle in the industry. And so we'll look, okay, the opportunities are cost savings, avoiding supply chain problems. I'd say also standardization. And you also have the opportunity to customize and create your areas of, of advantage. So you, you can create something that's unique to, to, your, um, to your own product. Now the challenges are safety. 
And safety not only in the product itself that you've manufactured and if it actually works, but also safety in terms of the equipment. Safety is um, incredibly important. And the digital information can be incomplete. Um, you have to, to prepare digital assets for on-site use. So um, sometimes there's a competency gap, and this is why there's so many opportunities now in um, 3D printing, because there are a lot, of, there are few people that have actually those skill sets to be able to to um, create this digital digital assets. Even though a lot of people are able to do um, smaller scale things, they aren't able to like actually do the um, customization. Another challenge is consistent powder, or the consistent feedstock, quality control in that, and also consistent metallurgy in the metallurgical properties. Okay, so we, the, another big advantage is fast prototyping of, of parts. And so let's say that um, we're in a situation where we've been in a downturn, we've like shut in our, our equipment, our, our wells, and then, we, and then we realize, ooh, these gas compressors or my heater treater or my mud pumps are, are like, mm, they're kind of needing some, some maintenance. And I can't get any because everybody's like the, the, the supplier went bankrupt. What do I do? So you can, you can do 3D printing and it'll save the day. And also you have a chance to um, generate complex geometries. So you can avoid casting. And that's incredibly important in terms of, of quick to market, rapid manufacturing. And it's also very important in a, in a, a world where we're actually going to see a lot of companies disappear or merge with others and very little, um, uh, very little uh, legacy or institutional memory. So you can avoid casting and you can use them for pumps, turbo machinery and valves. You can manufacture spare parts. Here's an example I just talked about earlier, the Rolls Royce or even a better one, the Volkswagen bug. <laughs> Imagine what you can do if you can find parts. You can find an old, an old Volkswagen Beetle and, and, and um, like manufacture parts for it. If you had a fleet of Beetles, you would be doing pretty well. And you can avoid overstocking of spare parts, and you can re avoid replacement and redesign. Or you can, you, you can, you're, it allows you to replace and redesign rather than being tied to a legacy system. And as we mentioned, you avoid risk from the companies that go out of business and stop manufacturing your key parts. Let's just go back to what we, where we started. 2020 realities, revisiting the dream. Now 2020 realities, we're living in a world of, of no travel to get, get um, and work with people on site or very little travel. Looking at a, a world of, of broken supply chains we're looking at a world with, with a number of, of failed companies that no longer will re, um, be able to provide the equipment that you need. So these are all opportunities. They're also challenges. And also we're living in a world that requires radical pivoting. So for the next two to three years, as you weather the downturn, where will the opportunities be? So can you um, look at your inventory of equipment and redesign a piece of equipment that no longer has any utility to one that is in high demand. So let's say, here's a 3D printing facilitated pivot. Convert nozzles that you can now use them for equipment for sanitizing purposes. So electrostatic spray or, or pouring disinfectant. You can convert pumps so they're used for different liquids, not just fuel or mud or drilling mud or drilling chemicals. You can convert transportation equipment so they can be used for mobile warehouses, refrigeration, logistics, um, mobile health units. Um, and you can con convert to personal protective equipment production. Oops. So anyway, that's the end. And I'm Susan Nash, AAPG.
feel free to get in touch with me. My email is snash at aapg.org or just better than that, connect with me on LinkedIn and I'm happy to take questions. Looks like we have one minute. Thank you so much, Susan, for the great presentation. We, we have a few questions. Uh, so this, the first question is, before producing a 3D design and printing it, do we need to do some finite element analysis or modeling to evaluate our design's performance, strength to pressure, ability to withstand temperature in our computer? Yes. Yes, yeah, I would recommend doing that. Um, so there are a number of, of um, there are a number of, of, of programs you can use, and it just depends on which which industry you're in. But, yeah, the end. Yeah. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, someone is asking if you can summarize the process uh, to transform the digital data to real object, like in a nutshell, because um, they didn't really uh, understand that. Okay. So essentially, when you transport it, it is just um, you just upload it to Dropbox. <laughs> And and download it into the into the equipment. Okay. So, so it's a database uh, computer. It's 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 computer driven. It's digital. So so essentially, your three D printer. I didn't I didn't point out where the, it connects in, but you can see on the three D printer. There's there's usually either a remote control, and it's, it's typically more remote. You don't have to go up to the actual printer but it's usually automated and done remotely. So you're at your workstation, you will um, um, just send, send it and chances are you'll, it'll be a cloud-based environment and, and it's, they're, they're large. So you, you probably will be working with the platform on like say Azure or something. Okay, so um, we have an interesting question. Um, can 3D printing potentially replace welding machines? Um, okay, the thing about 3D printing and welding machines, um, it depends on where you are. So 3D printing is great for pr printing and producing equipment that you take out into the field. Um, but if you have to weld equipment in you know in situ, I, I mean I don't or or you're creating a like let's say a pipeline. Um, I don't see that that's really ever going to replace a welder. Okay, so last question. Someone is very curious uh, about really um, the ability that we can print anything. So he's asking about the limitation of the design details and how we can produce you things using printing. Like what are the limitation of the, the design and stuff like that? I don't think that there are any limitations to the design. And in terms of, of like they, you can 3D print entire houses or manufactured homes. The, the, the limitation will be the printer um, and, and how you're going to assemble it because it, I don't think you're going to ever get a 3D printer itself that's going to be the size of the house. <laughs> but, but, but for components, um, yes, that's, that's not a, an issue at all. Um, and, and the answer is, yeah, you can, pr you can print anything, and I would practically, including organs, but whether or not you want to actually surgically put them into your body is another thing. <laughs> So you might have a, a replica of, um, of, of a hand and that's used for, for the vein system or nerves or whatever. And, and it's good for education, but, you know, I, I mean, they do bioprinting, but um, whether or not those are, even the bioprinting, like Cell Links has bioprinting and they, they print um, Basically, basically, again, it's a misnomer to say printing because basically they're cultures. 
in their growing and, and directing the growth of, uh, of different, different types of tissue. And, you know, whether or not those are, are accepted by the body, it's one thing. I don't know. Well, uh, great. Thank you so much, Susan, for the great presentation, everyone. The comment section are blown away, basically. <laughs> and <laughs> everyone wants to back for, you know, to delve more uh, to the subject of 3D printing. So again, thank you so much. Please go follow Susan and reach out to her on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you again, Susan. And everyone, we'll see you tomorrow in tomorrow's lecture. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It was really fun. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.